This conference will now be recorded. All right, I think we're going to give it another minute or so and then we'll get started for those of you that just joined. Maybe less than a minute. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I, I will probably have a few more folks join in, but uh, uh, thanks everybody for joining this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Walter Alcorn, the Hunter Mill District Supervisor. Um, and tonight we are doing this town hall on parking. So uh, tonight is one of uh, several town halls that county staff is uh, presenting information on an initiative called Parking Reimagined. And you can see that on your screen, at least for those of you that are uh, looking at this uh, with a display of some sort. Um, and this is looking at off-street parking and loading regulations. So basically, uh, any parking regulation in our zoning ordinance that is off-street uh, is potentially within scope of this initiative. This uh, was taken out of the ZMOD uh, regulations that were adopted by the board uh, just a few months ago. And this will allow for, uh, allow for uh, focus and discussion on the parking issue specifically. Now, before I turn it over to staff, just wanted to point out some things I think all of us know. This is uh, this is quite a challenging exercise to go through and update uh, the parking regulations for Fairfax County, in large part because Fairfax County covers a lot of different uh, places, uh, a lot of different communities, and a whole heck of a lot of different parking situations. So, you know, everything from, uh, you know, our lower density areas uh, to our older townhouse communities, some of which are not uh, adequately parked, in my opinion, uh, to our new uh, uh, developing areas next to metro stations and kind of everything in between. So um, this is, I think, uh, an important first step in having the discussion across the community on what is going forward what are the appropriate regulations for off-street parking and loading? So I want to thank everybody who's here for this. Um, you know, it is it is true. Uh, you know, we we this is not starting from a blank slate. You know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different situations. But the other thing that has struck me about 
about parking, and I'm sure this will come up during during the parking parking reimagined initiative here, um, is that we have lots and lots of privately owned parking, uh, and sometimes it seems we have more than enough parking, and sometimes we don't have enough. And <laughs> it's uh, you know other communities have uh, have developed with uh, different parking strategies, but we are where we are in terms of a very, I would say uh, we're dependent in large part on private parking um, for the vast majority of our communities. Now that may change, and that may be one of the things that's discussed through this process, uh, but uh, for now, let me uh, turn it over to staff. Who's got the short straw uh, tonight? Is, is it Michael? Is it you? or? It is me. It is me. Okay. Uh, well. I'll turn it over to you and uh, uh, I'm going to watch and listen and uh, and uh, look forward to the presentation and also questions and any any uh, uh, feedback from today's presentation. Well, thank you very much, Supervisor Alcorn. And good evening, everyone. We want to speak to you today about how we're going to begin to reimagine parking in Fairfax County. My name is Michael Davis, and I'm the project manager for this parking effort. In addition to county staff with you tonight, we also have members of our consultant team who will be providing information for this project later in the presentation. For the moment, though, I'm going to turn it over to Austin Gastrell for a few moments, who will discuss how to interact with and respond to this presentation tonight. Austin. Yes, good evening. Uh, please keep all mics muted and cameras off unless you're speaking. Uh, mic may be muted or unmuted using the mic button in the middle of your screen. To participate or ask a question, please raise your hand using the hand button shown in the bottom left of the screen and staff will call on you. If you do not see the raise hand button, please use the meeting chat function to alert staff that you have a question and someone will call on you. Uh, if you do not wish to speak but have a question, please leave your question in the chat box and staff will respond accordingly. If you're joining tonight via phone, I don't believe anyone is, but if anyone is tonight, uh, please make staff aware that you have a question and, and we will address it. Please note this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the Parking Reimagine webpage. And lastly, a link to a 10 question exit survey regarding tonight's town hall will be shared uh, at the end of the meeting. Participation in this survey is greatly appreciated and will help staff to better serve the community as a whole. Thanks very much, Austin. Most people own one or more vehicles and take for granted that they will be able to park these vehicles in their travels. Most of the time, people don't generally think about parking unless they can't find a convenient spot or there's an unexpected number of vehicles parked near their home. Yet parking is everywhere around us. Most every land use in the country requires some parking. When people drive and park, they're focused on finding a convenient space. They don't often notice the gray empty edges that rarely have vehicles parked. A key purpose of this project is to have people think about parking a little differently, to begin to think of it as a resource. And when you do that, you begin to consider the importance of that resource relative to other important elements we all care about, such as the environment, affordability, and land design. When parking has a community value, then you can think about how that value should be weighed against other initiatives. Parking is a land use, just like residences, office buildings, and shopping centers. This project intends to imagine how best to utilize that land resource. While the county is moving toward multimodal development that encourages more transportation options, such as walking, biking, and transit, driving is and will remain a common activity. This, of course, will require us to park these vehicles. Therefore, providing parking with land use activities will still be necessary. This project recognizes that parking will continue to be supplied. However, it's important that parking be sized to the average demand for it. The term that was created for this is right-sizing parking, which is to not underbuild or overbuild parking supply for a land use. While we strive to right-size parking and requirements, we also know there are places and uses that present parking challenges. This project will take in that information and look for ways to address those areas. Here I'll provide background information on some elements of parking that hopefully gives some insight on the operation of and influences on parking 
and the role these play in considering changes to the requirements. Parking is a land use, like your home, place of work, or where you shop. Parking has times of high and low demand. This can occur by the hour, day, month, or year. People know that during the holiday season, more people are out shopping and this increases parking demand. In January and February, less people are shopping and parking is freely available. While there can be times when it is difficult to find a parking space, parking should be constructed to address average demand. Within the county, there are places where you need a car for almost any activity beyond your home, and there are places where there are options that don't require a car. The character and location of a site can influence parking demand. In urbanized and higher density transit oriented areas, options that allow less reliance on a personal vehicle are available. It can even be possible to be car free. This lowers the need for dedicated parking areas. Also, there are development areas known as mixed use that contain residences, places of work, shopping and entertainment options. These types of combined uses can reduce the need for vehicle ownership for people who live or work there. Because the mixed use area has these closely located options, residents or employees can walk or bike. As one potential result, residents in these areas may decide to only own one vehicle instead of two, which reduces overall parking demand. Because parking is a resource, it can be operated to enhance its value. An example of this is shared parking. Rather than building the minimum required parking for an apartment building, an office building, and a retail center located on the same site, the demand for each of those uses can be studied and a smaller parking area can be built that provides enough parking for all these uses based on hourly demand. Looking now and toward the future, parking demand is changing with technology and people's behavior. Everyone's familiar with online ordering and home delivery of pretty much anything. This reduces parking demand when you don't have to go out and shop or eat. Also, even before COVID, remote working was growing annually. These trends and other technologies to come will continue to influence the need for parking. Parking areas should be considered a resource to the entire community. Its land area is a choice to use as parking. It could have been used for something else. When we consider the development of land, there are many elements that can be considered, such as the environment, site design, and affordability. These are balanced with the need to provide parking, and sometimes the parking supply itself creates a need to address its impact, it's like, such as stormwater runoff. Many times the parking requirements for a site control how a site can be used. Questions we are asking with this project are the extent of parking's role in land use. How much parking do we really need? What are the trade-offs for less or more parking on a site? Where can we balance parking supply with other site use possibilities that will provide a community benefit? We want people to begin to think about priorities related to parking. Should a large amount of convenient parking be the ideal? Or can we think about balancing car parking against other desirable features, like a quality urban streetscape that's inviting to safely walk and bike, or more open green space to enjoy cooling shade, or maybe provide something that's more interesting than this gray area? Every change has a consequence. If we were to look at the current problem with parking supply, how could we address it? Adding more parking is a solution, but what effects might that have? In any land use option, parking becomes a part of a cost benefit decision. What are the ideals we should be considering when making these decisions? Looking at the photo in this slide, if we wanted to add more parking to address the high demand depicted here, do we want to remove those trees in the background to add it? Or would having those trees be important enough to tolerate this amount of parking demand for a few hours a day? These are among the questions we would like you to think about as you listen to and view our presentation tonight. We hope you'll consider this when engaging us over the next 18 months as we reimagine park. Community engagement is a critical element of this project. We're seeking meaningful feedback from all elements of the community, including tonight's participants, who have personal experiences and thoughts about parking. But the community also includes business owners and tenants, land developers, nonprofit organizations, and religious assembly groups. Our engagement on this project will include those folks as well. We have learned during the pandemic that we can reach more members of the community with our tech resources. 
Nearly everyone has access to a smartphone and many are able to participate electronically, which has opened new doors for remote and mobile participation and feedback. We also have more traditional technologies such as cable channel 16 to use for communication. We plan to engage as many community members as possible during this project. The project itself will last about 12 to 18 months. During this time, we will gather community feedback in two distinct stages, but will always be open to receiving information and discussion. The first step starts tonight with this town hall to present our project and begin to hear from you. The second will be when we take that feedback and develop proposals for your consideration. This will occur about halfway through the 18 month period. This project will focus on off-street parking and loading. We have three basic goals for this project. Adding best practices and promising new ideas to operate parking now and in the future. Increasing clarity and flexibility in the administrative language of the ordinance, which includes looking more at the context of a site or area to determine its parking needs. And streamlining parking review and approval, which includes increasing predictability of review processes and times, as well as the results of those reviews. I'll now introduce Ian Banks, who is with our consulting team of Nelson Nigro. He will provide some additional background on their important role in this project and the activities they'll be working on to support it. Ian? Thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Ian Banks. I'm a principal here at Nelson Nygaard in our Washington DC office. Uh, we're a national transportation planning firm with uh, about 150 staff uh, and we're all, work, all working on creating sustainable, equitable, efficient transportation um, around the country as well as within the region of Washington DC. Um, I've been in the field for approximately 20 years and um, before coming to Nelson Nygaard, I was uh, with the city of Annapolis heading up their parking division. And so I have some insight, A, what Michael and his team certainly see on a day-to-day -day basis, but obviously how uh, new development happens um, from the planning aspects and site um, uh, decision aspects as well. Um, as Mike stated, we're, we are here, our team is to support staff in developing the recommended code changes uh, that will be brought before the Board of Supervisors. Um, as you may well know, the parking elements of the code um, haven't received sort of a, a comprehensive overhaul since 1988. Um, and obviously our communities and e economy um, are quite different since then. Um, obviously, just consider how much the internet has changed, how we travel, uh, how we do business, um, real-time transit information, deliveries, um, all of that kind of stuff has changed hugely and that obviously affects uh, the transportation system as well. Um, changes to the code can include a huge range of things that Mike has, has described so far, minimum parking requirements, shared parking, how does loading and queuing begin to impact site development as well. Um, and our work will begin to, to look to the future. So how, how will new development occur? How will that happen? Um, and ultimately and importantly, how it connects to your values as, as the community of, of Fairfax County um, and how do they represent the county's comprehensive plan, the strategic plan um, and other plans that will sort of begin to come uh, to fruition uh, in the future as well. Uh, we know that we all want efficient and varied transportation options that are ultimately sustainable, safe, accessible, um, affordable, and also equitable as well. Um, along with our partners at, at Clarion Associates, uh, Nelson Nygaard will be undertaking a sort of a number of activities um, over the next year to 18 months uh, in, in support of the parking reimagined process. Um, and obviously our first steps focus on hearing from you um, in events like this town hall, um, and in other ways that Michael has already uh, uh, described. Uh, in addition to hearing from you uh, about your experiences, we're working on several other fr fronts as well. Uh, we understand how complex Fairfax County's development is. There's lots of different development areas. There's Tyson's, Reston, Springfield, to less dense, almost rural areas of the counties as well. And we realize that diverse places need carefully crafted, context-sensitive solutions. Um, so we are gathering local data, predominantly from pre-COVID 2019 and earlier, uh, to begin to understand the current parking supply, demand and impacts. Uh, but also at the same time, we're beginning to understand how other jurisdictions, 
both nationally as well as locally and, and regionally have, modi have modernized their parking requirements. So, um, so that's it's 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 a case of looking at best practices and how they can potentially be um, related to the the solutions that we all, we need to solve here in Fairfax County. Um, and so, but we're also learning from recent experience in Fairfax County. So, uh, in collaboration with staff, we're looking at how recent development projects have treated parking. Um, how have the community staff, how the board of supervisors reacted to that, and how are and how are these developments coming before them? Uh, and so, we're going to be able to complement that understanding with an evaluation of transportation development trends now. Um, we obviously know that transportation is changing rapidly, not only um, as a result of COVID and the subsequent recovery from COVID, but um, also into a future where perhaps traffic um, uh, peak periods are, are, are going to change throughout the day. It's not going to be that typical um, morning and evening rush hour, perhaps. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be more spread out throughout the day as flexible schedules perhaps become the norm. Um, and finally, we're going to sort of develop proposed changes to the zoning code and, and how, and how um, it can be administered uh, through the development process and with Michael and his staff, um, the, the process that, that they go through uh, on a daily basis with each of these different projects. Um, and so working closely with staff that you've heard from tonight, Michael and Austin and, and, and others, we're going to ensure that the recommend, recommendations not only solve some of the issues that come before them, but also connect with the values that we hear from you uh, and, and, and the community as, as a whole. Um, so um, I'll hand it back to Mike to share with you sort of the timing and, and, some, and some of the expectations uh, as we begin to move forward. Um, and then we can perhaps get into um, some discussion points that where you can begin to, to highlight some of your thoughts about not only what you've heard tonight, but uh, the process going forward as well. Mike. Thanks very much, Ian. We've begun the first steps on the project. As Ian has summarized in his discussion, we've been getting feedback from other jurisdictions, both regionally and nationally, on the operation of their parking regulations and best practices. We intend to use this information to develop our proposals. Also, we've begun our community town halls and more specific discussions with focus groups to gain background and perspectives on parking here in the county. As we proceed, we will continue to get critical input from all these sources of information and begin to develop proposed changes to the zoning ordinance. Once we have a proposal, then we will come back to the community to get their feedback on that. Then we will finalize our proposal for final consideration. We have a project website that will be continually updated with information and opportunities to participate in the Parking Reimagined project. And tonight, we, as, as Austin noted, we have an exit survey and we, I will reiterate that uh, we really would like you to participate in that survey and provide us um, background information that will be helpful to this project. And as part of our uh, electronic engagement, uh, I would li also like to mention that as we move project, we will hopefully have additional surveys uh, available that will become more in depth as to uh, seeking feedback on specific uh, topics and information that uh, uh, are involved with the parking project. So uh, I, I hope that you will continue to come back to the website to uh, engage with us on the information that's there. We'll end our presentation with a few questions you might want to consider as you think about tonight's discussion. We hope this presentation helps you think about parking or perhaps think about it in a different way. We certainly feel that all feedback you provide has merit as it will help us define where we want to go for proposals to reimagine parking. I'll now turn it over to Supervisor Alcorn to introduce the next stage of our discussion. Thank you very much. All right, so at this point, I believe we will open it up. There are a number of questions that have been teed up um, that I think are on the screen uh, for folks to think about. And uh, 
Michael, at this point, we're going to be able to take questions verbally. Is that correct? If people raise their hand, are we doing that? Yes. Yes, we can. And Austin will also be moderating that. All right, Austin, we're going to be depending upon you to, to run the controls here. Um, and hopefully folks know how to raise their hand electronically. Austin, do you want to just go ahead and refresh us on that? Yeah, sure. No problem at all there. So uh, in the bottom left hand uh, of your screen, you should see a react button. There's going to be a hand symbol there. If you click on that button, it's going to have an option to raise your hand and it's going to show on the screen that you have your hand raised and, and one of the staff members will, will call upon you. Now, if you don't have that, it's a weird go to meeting thing. Sometimes you don't have it um, in the chat box. So in the top right up next to that kind of gear and the people you know sign in the top right, there's that chat bubble. You can click on that and you can just type into the chat that you have a question and and we'll address the question, call upon you to speak. Or if you, if you prefer not to speak, you can just ask a question in the chat box and we'll address it then. All right, Austin, thank you very much. And again, the questions are uh, on the screen. Also, it looks like Austin, you put them up there. Um, questions like, how does parking work for you uh, in each of these places? What is more important to you in these places, parking or the quality of the experience? Do you want to travel to and around places by walking, biking, taking transit, or maybe all of them? Uh, what would be an acceptable substitute for a large supply of parking and how do you think travel options and preferences will change in the next 20 years okay does anybody have their hand up yet yeah it looks like looks like burton had said that they have uh, he have a question all right burton, burton welcome hi supervisor uh, alcorn and nice to see gary too hey gary mm -hmm. um hello yeah, burton. Uh, how you doing burton thanks um, I just wanted to say I'm glad that this effort is being undertaken and I agree with the approach, you know, the, the values based approach. Uh, you know, I think that um, the regulations um, are due for an update um, and uh, <clears throat> the consultant seems very well qualified, um, even though he sounds British. <laughs> um, I guess we can trust him, though. Um, <laughs> So uh, just some comments for me, and I'm looking at, I, I jotted down some notes, and I'm also um, looking at these questions, but um, one thing I thought of as the presentation was happening is that part of why we need parking is because of all the parking. Um, you know, I, I live in a place uh, near the Reston Town Center. Um, it's walking distance to the town center, but to walk to the town center, I have to walk by a bunch of mostly empty, empty parking lots. And I would rather there be helpful destinations, you know, worthwhile destinations that are closer to me uh, that, you know, where I don't have to walk by all those parking lots. It's not very nice to walk by parking lots. I'd rather walk by attractive buildings. I'd rather walk by trees. Um, so, and I think, I think I'm normal in my preferences on that. And so because there's all these parking lots that you have to walk through uh, from my neighborhood to get to the library or to get to the town center, a lot of people are kind of um, persuaded, I think, to drive uh, because they know that there's going to be plenty of parking when they get there. It saves them the the irritation of walking by the the parking lots. Uh, and, you know, there's really no reason not to drive. They already have a car because they they need a car for the other destinations that they go to. So, um, so that's my experience on that. Um, just basically the, what I think of as the current oversupply of parking is causing more driving and, and uh, kind of perpetuating the need for more parking with the parking that is already there. Um, as far as like um, where I work, I work in a, an office complex that, um, you know, I, I kind of question whether it should have been uh, developed in the first place because it was, you know, um, it's, it was developed far away from transit, far away from, um, you know, existing development. 
And uh, the normal thing to do to get there is drive. I mean, everyone drives and, um, you know, there's not enough parking because everyone um, expects to drive. Um, and just, it seems like a shame. Um, I, um, I bought a COVID car. Um, I'm one of the people who uh, bought a car during COVID. I hadn't had a car for um, my own personal car for about 10 years before that. Um, but I, I wanted to um, get out to the Shenandoah National Park. And um, I normally bike um, for my transportation, but um, my backup was Metro or the bus or rideshare. And all of those options were less attractive with COVID. So I had enough money and I just bought myself a car. And um, it was kind of an easy decision to buy that car, partly because I knew that I'd be able to park it for free on my neighborhood street. And, you know, that's a cost that my community is paying for. Um, you know, we spent more than $100,000 to get our pavement redone, we're going to have to keep on paving that pavement, um, you know, every so often. And, um, you know, this is not a, this is a private community that I live in, but, you know, I would say at least 40% of the pavement that we have is simply because of parking needs. Um, so, you know, there's a cost to there's a cost to to me um but you know it's already paid for i'm already paying for that i'm gonna have to pay for that asphalt whether i use it or not so because it's already paid for you know i thought well i might as well get a car and um i go for a couple weeks often without driving it but you know it's nice to have it's a luxury i don't really need it but um because the parking is so easy and free to me um on the margin you know, why not? Um, I think it would be, you know, even though that's my experience as an individual, I think, you know, when you realize that there are people like myself who are making these sorts of decisions, it all adds up to people are really um, having higher rates of car ownership than maybe they, they should or they would otherwise if parking policy was really optimized and thought through better. Um, and I think um, personally, I'd be um, open to some changes to the way the county does things to make individuals more conscious of the fact that parking does cost money. Um, whether you're paying for it as part of your taxes, whether you're paying for a permit to park on the street, um, or whether you're paying it at a parking meter, it costs something. And I think that um, there's a, a public health um, benefit to making that cost felt at the point where that parking is consumed. Um, I think I've uh, talked enough uh, now uh, for now, and thanks a lot for listening. I appreciate you setting up this meeting and um, appreciate the county staff and the consultants' time. Gordon, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, you sharing your, your comments and thoughts uh, and appreciate your engagement uh, on this process. Um, Absolutely. Gary, sorry to cut you off. Gary, it looks like you have your hand up and you're next. Gary, welcome. Gary, I think Harriet. you're still muted. Sorry. <laughs> oh, there we oh, go. Okay. That's it. Um, uh, just follow along with Burton with thanking you for, for doing this and having this kind of outreach and not only for people here tonight, but others to be able to, you know, input to this process. Um, I, I live in Ruston and I'll have some comments on, on that in, in a second. But we'll say I moved from D.C. to um, for, to uh, at Annandale in 1951 and lived in there, uh, Lincolnia, Springfield, a number of places in Fairfax and here in Ruston. 
So I have an interest in this from obviously the Hunter Mill perspective, but also, you know, other places in the county because I've lived here so long. Um, and I think this is going to be a critical effort uh, to make parking as good as it can be uh, in the county. I will say that, uh, you know, I do see issues with not having the parking where, for instance, here in Ruston Town Center, um, we have a metro that has been designed without, you know, adequate parking or easy walkability. So the usability of that uh, for even residents close, not too far from it, um, will have difficulties. And so when other, you know, land use and, and um, transportation issues uh, get in the way, you, you know, having assumptions that um, you automatically have some advantage being close to a metro may not necessarily be the case. There are also issues with, with south, south of Wiley here and, 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 and Herndon Monroe. Um, so, you, you know, we need to make sure that we take care of the parking, just as you've described, and think about all the issues that go into that. All of those being laid out here, I think, are most of them being laid out, but make sure we have the assumptions down. And while, as Burton has pointed out, uh, you know, getting easy access to be able to walk is important, and I, I think I've enhance that importance by talking about the accessibility of the metro. Um, we can't forget we still have the cars and we need to have that balance and adequate parking. In my own personal experience, I was in DC. I worked there for lots of years and lived there when I was a kid. Uh, but, um, uh, you, you know, I was going to a special event and had a chance to check the restaurant out I was going to um and the parking was such unavailable it was just so difficult it was going to be a saturday night and that changed your mind and went here to great falls um because the parking uh, availability was difficult and we still need to have a vibrant um, business community uh where um, restaurants and all the other entities flourish um, uh, retail and so forth. Uh, we also don't chase away people buying into a building or renting a leasing in a building because there aren't adequate parking spaces and they make a choice to go, you know, maybe somewhere else in the county or they make a choice to go to um, Loudon or Prince William. So just things to think about as we go through this while, um, you know, we're focused on parking. We also need to think about the other impacts that Burton talked about and, um, you know, getting someplace by other means. So thanks for just listening to that. Gary, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, your engagement on this and, and sharing your thoughts and observations as well and uh, your experience from around the county. I actually have experienced different places in the county over the decades too a little bit. So. Uh, that's, right. That is, that does provide some insight. Um, who else do we have, Austin? Any other hands up? Oh, there's no hands up right now, but we can open it up for anyone who who has a comment or or a question or uh, anything of the like. All right. Can I go again? Sure, Gary. Go ahead. Absolutely. Um, just. Uh, I, I, maybe we're going to talk to more of the consultants here. I took it to be that uh, the speaker um, and Clarion are going to be assisting the county staff. It looks like from the presentation, there are two other consultants possibly and just what their roles are going to be. Um, also, as another issue, how often are there going to be meetings? How are they going to be handled? Um, those kind of things as you go through this. Are you going to have more communication with citizens as you go through this? Um, that kind of thing. 
I can go ahead and start to field that question. If others have any further input, they can jump in. Uh, but the the consultant team that we have is Clarion Associates and Nelson Nygaard. You may have seen two other logos on the slide presentation, and those are the two county staff agencies uh, that are collaborating uh, right. on the project. Not a <laughs> Yeah, so it's Land Development Services, that I, which is the organization that I work for, and then the Department of Planning and Development, which is the organization that Austin works for. And so because the zoning ordinance is primarily administered by uh, the Department of Planning and Development, they have a key role in the project. But critically, the uh, parking regulations are uh, administered by the Director of Land Development Services. And so that's why I'm involved in this project uh, to, um, because we'll be making decisions and so forth on parking and changes um, that at the current time, the director of land development services would be directly involved with. As far as timing is concerned and, and outreach, we're gonna be going to, we're doing town halls with um, all the supervisor districts over the next month or so, I think we'll be into January a little bit on that, possibly. Um, but we're also doing a lot of more specific outreach. We intend to um, have focus groups that we'll be talking to. Um, and so there could be some, um, there'll definitely be community participation in those focus groups. We, you know, but it'll be, um, as I talked about in the presentation, there there could be industry groups involved in those conversations, um, nonprofit organizations, and things of that nature. Uh, so we'll be doing that kind of simultaneously with this um, town hall outreach, and then there'll be um, as part of the pro. I mean, the 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 rationale for the town halls and for these other outreach efforts is to help us develop recommendations for the project. So as we move through this um, outreach process, engagement process um, through the spring of next year, we'll begin to develop some proposals and then we'll come back to the community. We'll probably have another series of town halls similar to this where we'll introduce proposals uh, for the parking project and then um, get feedback on those proposals. Um, so that's, there. those are the two kind of main elements of engagement that we'll have with the community as a whole. Um, I think also we're talking about having a, a, a large community meeting where every, you know, all everyone, it's not district supervisor district focus. We're talking about having a community meeting sometime in January or February as well. Um, and then there's always the opportunity to participate through our website, Parking Reimagined website. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there you know hopefully we'll have some more surveys up where we can get a little bit deeper, uh, a little bit of a deeper dive into people's thoughts and perspectives on parking, uh, as well as you know the steps that we're going through on the project itself. Those those items will be posted for people to look at and evaluate and comment on. And um, we also have a list serve. Uh, so that you can get on the listserv and then we can continue to update you as well on the um, on the project. Thank you very much. All right, it looks like uh, Sarah Knox had a question. Uh, she's commented in the chat. Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Austin. Um, and hello to many of the familiar faces on this call. Um, Really appreciate you all coming out here to engage the community with this endeavor. And I do appreciate that it's not an easy one. You have a very diverse community to address many different parking issues with. So I know this will be a well thought out, but a, not without challenge. Um, and one thing that I really wanted to discuss and build on was how travel options and preferences have already changed and are continuing to change over the next 20 years. Uh, Metro is obviously a big component of how transportation functions in this community and how development is, you know, reacting to that more transit-oriented focus. Um, 
but a lot of that development is redevelopment. So there's this, this challenge of reconciling current parking demands with your long-term decades down the road parking expectations and demands. And so I'm interested to see how you navigate those current perspectives on leasing and how, you know, office and other more commercial uses demand parking today versus what we'd like to get them to in the future. Um, and a lot of that, as others have mentioned, is going to rely on strategies, not only with reducing parking requirements, but also, you know, making things more accessible without a vehicle. So looking forward to all that you develop through this process and being involved along the way. All right, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your comments there. Austin, do we have anybody else? Uh, I don't see anyone else at this moment. Um, one thing to, to Sarah's comment, and sorry, I got my camera turned on here. Um, is that one uh, something that we're doing with our consultant team is, is is looking at these these other jurisdictions that have recently uh, adopted new codes, and I think it's a really important part of this project to determine what other jurisdictions are doing, how are they innovating to address these parking issues, and then and then further looking at these trends, and it's something that I think we need to know that moving forward trends will change, and, and how can we there's there's no one size fits all fix to it, but but how can we kind of adapt our ordinance to be able to be flexible to these future trends without having to do o complete overhauls of our ordinance? So, innovation and flexibility, I think, are two things that we're looking for in this ordinance, and something that we're looking towards peers locally and nationally to see how other jurisdictions have d handled those types of situations. Great, Austin. Actually, I'll, let me follow up with a question on that and. Uh, this may be for Michael, uh, either too. Um, but uh, will we be able to um, monitor the performance of similarly situated developments? As, uh, for example, you know, in in parts of Reston, definitely in in parts of Tyson's, you know, we're we're seeing uh, projects come online now with with lower parking requirements. Um, you know, is there going to be a feedback loop uh, to see? frankly, if the projections are working out short term uh, or are there problems, that, that kind of thing. I'm curious if uh, that's going to be part of this initiative as well. Yeah, I'll let Mike take a stab on that um, since he deals with the actual nuts and bolts of parking every day, being with LDS and being the parking manager for LDS. Mike, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, that, I, I, I would love to have that data. Um, and there are a couple of different ways we could possibly get it. I mean, you had mentioned that we had had some recent parking reductions in Reston, and um, from that, you know, there's this before and after sort of analysis that would be nice to have. And, you know, one of the things that we could consider is when we're looking at a parking reduction, to see, uh, talk to the applicants or, and see if they're willing to do follow-up analyses to give us that data. And there's a lot of ways to collect data these days that's not labor-intensive. You know, there are a lot of electronic systems, garage, entry and exit, that can help you uh, gather that data. And certainly it could be data that's not um, sensitive, you know, just basic vehicle counts and that sort of thing. Um, you know, Tyson's Mall has the ability to count available spaces um, to be able in real time, and I think Reston Town Center does this too, that, um, you know, they have a real time um, display that says, okay, well, there are, you know, 300 spaces available in the garage. So, so that technology is available to do that. Um, the question would also be um, whether, you know, for what extent of time, you know, like, uh, you know, what would be your survey periods and that sort of thing. But I, I do think it's doable and that's, it's, it's an intriguing idea to try to explore further, I think, with this project and also kind of outside the project. Mike, thank you for that, uh, that response. I, I... I'm just thinking in my own head all the complexities of deciding 
you know, in what situation is it working or is it not? But on the other hand, I think it'd be an extremely good, helpful exercise um, to understand. Uh, I mean, even if it's uh, uh, even a, even if a project was approved, uh, assuming there would be some on-street parking associated with it, uh, you know, uh, are the is the garage still filling up? You know, I I, I think lots of questions would arise. And I, I think the more we can know uh, about how things are working, even in the short term, even even though I know we expect, uh, particularly for commercial properties, uh, to see uh, a decline over time in auto usage, uh, at least near metro stations. Um, that data short term, I think, could be extremely helpful. Yeah, I mean, you know, the goal of this project is to get to some, I mean, one of the goals i will say i don't want to say a specific goal but one of the goals of the project is to look at it look at parking in terms of right sizing mm -hmm. and i think like that would get us there a little bit get us there a little bit more with a fine grain of being able to say and of course every site is different every site has different uses every site has different demand characteristics but you know if you could if you could use that information in a, on a more general basis to be able to say, you know, these these types of uses generate this amount of parking on average um, in Fairfax County, in any all that that level of detailed data would certainly be helpful <laughs> if we could. Get it. Very good. All right, thank you, Austin. We have other hands or other comments, yeah, questions. Yeah, one one thing I was gonna to bring up, we we do have Burton had just messaged me that he's got a couple comments, but right before Burton, two things that I wanted to say is that one way that and this just popped in my mind. So working for the Department of Planning and Development, I deal with you know uh, looking at rezonings, reading proper conditions, looking at these different types of development. It's it's, it's an idea. It's something that you know we we want that data. That's extremely important data to have to figure out how those reductions are panning out, how parking uh, resources are being used. And I, I think personally something that may be tough, and I'll let Ian speak on this and how we're doing a little bit of our, our research on those types of metrics and data is, is how do we collect that data? And it's how do we ask, do, is it just an ask that we say, hey, can you just give us that data for your development? Or is it something that we, we do through some sort of a proffer or a development condition where we almost require a readout after so long on those types of things? And it's something to think about and then it kind of gets again towards some of that innovation of, of not only parking as a whole, but how we collect that data within the county. But, but I wanted to pass it real quick to Ian to kind of talk about some of the ways we're looking into different types of research and how we're doing some of that data collection nationally and locally. Yeah, so I mean, I mean obviously we've, we work with a number of different jurisdictions as well as private developers around the country as well as locally and regionally as well so so there, there's certainly be going to be a host of data that we can begin to 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 draw on uh, but i think specifically as as we look at fairfax and and, it, and its particular solutions we we will be uh, trying to pinpoint some some particular uses that we will actually go out into the field um, and try and collect some real-time data as well. Um, so we, for example, we did that um, a few years ago before COVID when, when we helped the county um, uh, take a look at the, um, the parking requirements for the regional shopping malls. And so, um, we, so, so we did go out there and collect that data and, and come up with real life um, instances where we can actually make decisions based upon that real life data. Um, but, um, so, so, so that aspect will certainly be going on, and I mean, I think at this point we will certainly wait until after the holidays. And so, I mean, typically we don't collect data during the holidays because they do tend to get a little bit skewed. Um, so, so as we get into the new year, we'll begin to start thinking about what what land uses do we have data for? What do we think would be useful to get some real time data? Um, but then we'll also be reaching out to some other local jurisdictions as well, as, as, well, as well as developments that have been uh, perhaps approved relatively recently within both the, the, the county and, and built, uh, but also um, within the region too. I mean, um, we've, uh, we've spoken with a number of peer jurisdictions already, and, and we also do a lot of work with Arlington County. And, and we know from their site plan planning process, um, that every multi-use and residential development that, that gets built and approved 
um, at various time frames after the the full build out and occupancy, they have to hunt, they have to undertake a transportation monitoring program. So, um, uh, so that's a something that Fairfax could consider within their site plan planning process. But what what um, Arlington County do with their data is that they they it's it's a relatively detailed travel survey of residents and visitors, but it also begins to take a look at the how the parking is being utilized over an entire week and whether or not uh, the parking requirements that were um, proffered and approved through those site uh, plans are a working for for that particular development, but then they begin to use that data um, as guidance for future developments as well, based upon their location within the county and the type of use and things like that. So um so i think there's there, there's lots of good best practices that we can begin to uh to to use and to 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 leverage um as we get into that uh, particularly into that data phase and one yeah, thing you. It's made me excited about the project so thank you <laughs> well the one thing that i want to add um with regard to ian's comments and just the general discussion about follow-up data is you're very sensitive about the COVID situation and this project. Um, the project occurs at a time when there's some uncertainty about uh, long-term trends, you know, um, the situation that we had COVID versus where we will head after COVID. Um, and certainly it was part of the discussion with the project about whether or not we could do surveys during this time period based on how demand has changed so much and whether that's a permanent situation. So we just, we just have to be very cautious about how we would conduct those types of surveys now. Um, we can certainly take information that we would have had pre-COVID and kind of project out what that could be, um, you know, sort of look at the trends that were occurring prior to COVID and kind of extrapolating from that a little bit. But I just, I just want to make, you know, for the audience, I just want to make uh, make it clear that we are being considerate of the situation that's being cre been created by COVID, and we have to keep that in mind as we move forward. All right, very very good, thank you. Um, did Burton have a couple of comments? Burton did. Burton did. Go ahead, Burton. Hello again. Uh, I just thought some more about the last couple bullet points on this slide, and uh, I'm going to share my thoughts uh, with you. Um, so on the point of what would be an acceptable substitute for a large supply of parking, uh, I think two important things there are, you know, people need to, people want to get to a place and often they need to get their stuff to a place too. Um, a, a car is useful uh, for transportation, but it's also, it, it has a function of like a mobile locker room. That's what it was for me when I was in the army. It was a place where I could just have all of my crap that I wasn't sure whether I was gonna need it or not, but just in case I did, it was there. I could go grab it out of my car. Um, so it was like a mobile storage locker. Um, and um, and I think that is still a, a function of a car right now. So, you know, you can have um, great public transportation, but to the extent that people still want to haul a lot of stuff around with them, um, that doesn't take care of that part of the demand um, and I'm not sure what does um, on the um, on the the question of travel options and preferences and how they'll change over the next 20 years um, I would say people naturally prefer what they already do and what's easy so unless there's a trigger that's gonna like force them to change, uh, they're going to prefer to just keep doing what they're doing, which for the most part is driving cars. Um, 
Um, micro mobility options like scooters and um, and uh, e-bikes. That was a trend that I saw increasing in Fairfax County even even before COVID hit, um, and it it seems to me that it's continued to increase in popularity now that we're in COVID. So I think it's pretty safe to assume that that trend is going to continue post COVID. Um, Micro mobility options like that are uh, that include like um, battery technologies where you know the the power that's in the battery is in a, a smaller and smaller scale. Um, it means that um, for people who are either lazy or physically unfit, um, they're going to be able physically to accomplish a transportation goal without their car. But if they already have a car, why would they switch? You know, why are they going to switch? You know, when they are, if they already have a car, they already know that they're going to be able to park it. What's going to be the motivation to choose that micro mobility option, which could be another expense? Um, let's see. Um, uh, so on, uh, on acceptable substitutes again, so I'm kind of jumping around, but you know, good transit is, uh, might be an acceptable substitute, but it's like, um, you know, how good can the transit be if the destinations are all spread out? You know, if you have to, uh, you know, if it's, if it's a pain to get to the stop, you know, if the service is infrequent, and then there's so many other stops because all the des destinations are spread out, so it takes forever to um, to get to where you want to go. You know, it's kind of a pain. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation where if you had dense development, then transit would be more appealing. Um, but you know, we are in the situ situation that we're in. And then um, I um, care quite a bit about privacy, um, you know, um, identity privacy. And like, I, um, I'm i going to have a preference over the next 20 years for transportation options that don't require me to give up information about myself in order to move from point to point. So I don't want to be tracked. Um, so that that is a hesitation for me with um, ride sharing and um, public transportation. Not not just not so much, but um, but you know we've got a lot of federal government employees in Fairfax County that have um, these sorts of concerns also, and so I I think that you should. Um, consider that people want to be anonymous when they're moving around. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Burton. Appreciate those those points. Austin, we have any other comments teed up? No, no other comments thus far. Okay. Anyone have any comments or questions they want to raise? All right. Well, unlike our yeah. rest and comprehensive task force meetings, we don't have to go to the very end of it. Well, Gary, Gary's got a question. His hand Gary, just was raised there. There we go. Keep going. <laughs> Gary, you're on mute. Uh, I was just laughing that um, Burton and I are here. So we, we talked about transportation issues a good bit in, in uh, the rest and comprehensive plan task force. So we can we can add a few more here i think um i think burton's points were really important to think about and as you're looking at a parking policy it's the impacts of you know the other transportation modes and how they impact parking um and so if you can make sure as we're studying this and i, I think mike davis pointed out we're doing it at a very difficult time for studying um, and that absolutely has to be taken into consideration that we make it, you know, strong enough study wise to know we're making, you know, the right choices here. So Burton's just comments are, 
Um, maybe we need to broaden the thoughts a little more. Um, my second question is this one is the next time we're, we're going to see something from you. I know we can interact with you um, through the website. Uh, is there other plans for um, communication? Uh, beyond that, so a lot of the citizens won't know about this. Sure. I, mean, I know about it from the Rest and Comprehensive Tan Plan Task Force, but I missed it. And I think others did, even though it was on Supervisor Alcorn's website. Um, and we do look at that <laughs> for sure. Um, that, uh, you know, we make sure we're covering a lot of citizens in the county. So, yeah, after about how we make that communication could be very important as we go down the line here. Yeah, ab absolutely, Gary. It's something that, that I personally have been working a lot on is just, just how to get the word out, how to reach more people. And so kind of our plan moving forward is that um, web, the website's going to be our, our main uh, source of information uh, for meetings and upcoming events. Um, we rely as well on different supervisors districts and their social medias, their outreach, their newsletters and things like that. And so what our plan is kind of moving forward is that, as Mike said, this is kind of phase one. This is our initial listening phase to figure out what we need to change. And going forward, groups like Rest and Task Force, other industry type groups and specific groups, we would come out and meet with these different groups. Um, and then further, we would come back to the community as a whole. As Mike said, it's not out of the question that we'll do more town halls in the future. So I think right now what we're attempting to do is to start that conversation, figure out kind of what what are the things that we need to change in our ordinance uh, and then come back to the community with those proposed changes. So to your question of, is there a planned uh, upcoming planned uh, event that's on the calendar? Not yet, but there will be other events on the calendar soon. Um, I would suggest uh, in the chat, I put a, 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 a link to our webpage. I would suggest uh, bookmarking that and coming back and looking for future upcoming events. And also I put our, our survey in the webpage. And so, on our on our web page we do have uh not only um upcoming events presentations things like that we have a a common email address for our uh for our amendment that um anyone can email us send us ideas ask us questions and things like that so suggest um even anyone that you know that may be interested in this topic that that didn't wasn't able to make it tonight um if you could share that email address and i will say too is that this actually um this town hall which is being recorded will also be put up on our web page as well thank you very much all right gary thank you again um anyone else have questions or comments okay well uh Austin or Mike, you have any final closing thoughts or comments? Uh, I would just like to thank everyone who participated tonight. And I'm glad that we have had this opportunity to kick off this project with the community. And um, certainly looking forward to hearing more feedback and perspectives on parking in the county and, and how it affects your life and, and your circumstances. So. Uh, Supervisor Alcorn, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to host this tonight for us. Well, thank you. Thank you to others on county staff and also the consultant uh, for this. And most of all, thank you uh, uh, to the citizens here that uh, spoke and, and participated. And I do want to encourage folks, if they have additional comments, I, you've heard how to, how to provide those thoughts. Um, and this is really just the beginning of a, of a long process. Uh, and as always, don't hesitate to contact my office uh, with questions or concerns about either the substance or the process or any of this. So um, I guess with that, we will end a little bit early. So uh, thanks, everybody, again, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Supervisor Alcorn.